morning, everybody. I'd like to start by thanking the Executive Committee for accepting what could be termed a controversial subject. Have you been converted? Uh, it's very brave of you, actually, and um, it could be interpreted as being a little rude. Who am I to come over here and to challenge you to say, have you been converted? So let me just try and get this clear first. Who I'm challenging is myself. I'm trying to take a long, hard look at my own life and my own discipleship and to say, have I really been converted? Has the Lord Jesus Christ made a difference in my life? Am I the same person now as I would have been if I had not met the Lord Jesus Christ? And by expressing it as, have you been converted, I'm hoping that in some small way, you will begin to challenge your own life too, just to see whether your journey of conversion is what it should be. Is it what the Lord Jesus Christ intended it to be? Are you and I walking in those works which the Lord God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them? So, it is for me quite a serious question. What started me thinking about it is when I came across this quotation in Luke chapter 22 when the Lord Jesus turned round to Peter and said, When thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And here was the Lord Jesus talking to Peter who had been following him for the last three years, who had lived every moment of every day with our Lord, who had been through umpteen experiences, and yet the Lord Jesus was still talking to him in terms of when you are converted. So how are we to understand this idea of conversion? It, it struck me again when I was reading Luke chapter 16. Please can you turn there with me to Luke chapter 16. It's the parable of the dishonest manager. It's some of the most challenging words I think that we come across in Scripture. And it arrested me when I read verse 1. He also said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. Now I don't know what your thoughts are about the judgment seat, brothers and sisters, and I'm constantly amazed at the number of brothers and sisters that I meet who live in fear of the judgment seat. Of long-serving brothers and sisters who are still concerned that the Lord Jesus Christ will not forgive them of their sins. And that worries me. I am completely confident that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is far bigger than anything that I do. Even the things that I habitually do. Even the things that I willfully do. He is able to forgive. He is moved with compassion. And he will welcome me into his kingdom. That is not my concern when I meet the Lord Jesus Christ. What worries me is these words in Luke 16 and verse 1. You have wasted my possessions. Did you not see what I blessed you with? Do you not realise what talents you have that I gave to you individually? Did you not see the opportunities that I put in your path? You have wasted them. You could have done so much more. You could have become even more like the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm still going to welcome you into my kingdom because that is the sort of Lord that I am. But there were things that I had to do a different way because you did not do them for me. And so the challenge that I take upon myself is, am I wasting the possessions, the ability, the time that the Lord Jesus Christ has blessed me with? Have I been converted? 
It's almost, if you come to verse 10 of Luke chapter 16, you get here where the Lord says, one who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. There's, there's what we call in, in the UK law a, a breach of trust and confidence. And in those rare occasions when I have to dismiss people at work, it is because they have breached my trust and my confidence in them. Not necessarily I trust their inability to work and to do a professional job, but I no longer trust them to act in the best interests of the company. I no longer trust their integrity and their honesty. And if you can be honest in a little, then you'll be honest in a lot. And if I can trust you in a little, I can trust you in a lot. With what is the Lord Jesus trusting me in my discipleship? Am I breaching his trust and his confidence in me? And it's interesting that this, this steward who was wasting his possessions immediately knew what was coming his way. And he sat down and he looked at all the debtors. And he went to the debtors and he wrote off some of their debts. And he did all these deals with them to gain favour with them. And the Lord actually commends him, doesn't he, in verse 8. The, the master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And the lesson that speaks to me is, if someone who is dishonest is prepared to sit down and plan and think about their future and to work out what is best for them, then surely there is an obligation on the sons of light to sit down and to plan and to work out how they can serve their master with the gifts that they have been given, with the talents that they have, with the time that they have at their disposal. Have I been converted? Am I being shrewd with the blessings that the Lord Jesus Christ has given me. And so we come to this idea of conversion. What, what, what is conversion? And I think there's four things that we can think about just by way of introduction and it is the fourth that we will dwell on for the rest of this week. The first is this idea of belief. We come in faith. We grow in faith. There's a moment when we see clearly what the Lord Jesus Christ is after. When we see all these first principles fall into place, we realise what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. And we are convicted of these things in which we believe. The things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. And it is with that faith and that settled conviction that we base the rest of our life. That surely is the start of conversion. The second step is, is one of repentance. When we realise who it is that we come to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, and we come to look at ourselves and we see the great gulf between the Lord Jesus and ourselves, we realise, just as Peter had to do, that we have to fall on our knees. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. And we come to repent of those things that we have done. This, this metanoia. This afterthought, this thinking differently to change one's mind. And the Lord Jesus Christ went to enormous lengths to make an impression on those people that they would just stop and reflect and realise that they needed to change their mind about the direction in which they were travelling. He spoke to them in parables that they might think, well, I wonder what that means. He did wonderful miracles that they might realise that there is a, a more powerful being than they. And they ought to stop and think, what does this God have to do with me? He even raised this man called Lazarus that they might realise that someone has power over death itself. And life is just not a matter of three score years and ten. And he even went to the cross. 
that he might demonstrate his love in the most powerful way possible. To encourage us, to each of us stand individually at the foot of the cross to witness the power of God. To some, it makes no difference. It is just folly. But to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God that someone was willing to lay down their life for us. And so then it is up to us to repent and to do things differently. And so the scriptures are quite clear, aren't they? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. You can come to faith, but unless it leads you to change your mind, there is no salvation. And the Lord God is so long-suffering and so patient in giving us time to come to our senses, willing that all should come to a knowledge of repentance. And so each of us come then in this second step of conversion to consider repentance. And and this is what a sister in my ecclesia at Nottingham Jarvis Avenue wrote about repentance. She's, She's a Greek scholar and I find her thoughts so very helpful. She says this, Sin is a shortcoming of which we are all aware. And it requires a change of attitude, a recognition of failure, an acknowledgement of inadequacy, which is true repentance. We can't stand there in our own strength. We have to recognise our deficiencies and our inadequacies and the great gulf that stands between us and the perfect character of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when Tyndale came to to translate the scriptures, Tyndale translated this word metanoia as as a change of mind. And at the times, the church leaders were translating this as to do penance. And it was interesting coming over with Jim and Marty. Jim was referring, as he often does, he referred to an occasion when he was listening to the radio and there was someone who was talking about going to a priest who was giving a confession. And he had to go away and do penance. That is not repentance. Repentance is a change of mind. It is an attitude of mind, a humility to confess failure and to ask forgiveness. That, I suggest, is the second step of conversion. The third step is baptism. This this washing, this sanctification, this justification, this, this deliberate action that we choose to do in front of witnesses to go into those waters of baptism and to come back up again. Whether it's in a cattle trough, whether it's in a river, whether it's in a bath. It is that deliberate conscious action to associate ourselves with the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That public confession... And that experience too of going in and coming back out again. And when I was getting my thoughts together on this subject, I ran, I ran a workshop with some brothers and sisters around conversion and I asked people, well, why were you baptised? Why were you baptised? And I got a range of answers. It was the next step in my relationship so that my sins could be forgiven, said one. It was necessary. I needed to be born of water, said another. I wanted my sins to be forgiven. After all, he died for me. I had talked to people who believed. I was moved by their personal testimony. And I wanted that relationship with the Lord, said another. I wanted to please God. It was the result of a powerful prayer. I wanted to be in the kingdom. Well, it was always going to happen, said somebody else. There was no reason I could not be. Well, you see, I met these kind Christadelphians and I was moved with the love that they showed me. 
Well, it all clicked into place at a youth weekend, said another. It made sense, it felt right, it was a decision I made with my head, but not my heart. Another one honestly said, well, there was a young lady involved. Others said, I was scared. There was the Suez crisis, the Six-Day War, President Sadat assassinated the First Gulf War. And I did not know what the future held. I knew I needed to be baptised. Another said, I was facing a tribunal. Well, I was under peer pressure. And I didn't want to get left behind. I was facing university and I had a series of big decisions to make. I found myself preaching to others and they said, well, why aren't you baptised? I was disillusioned with my Anglican faith. I remember cycling in the rain and feeling empty and void, thinking there must be something far much better than this. Now, I don't know whether your reasons for baptism are the same as these reasons given by these groups of brothers and sisters here. But all of them said, without a doubt, I have moved on from when I was baptised to now. I have grown in understanding, yes. And my perspective of life has changed. And it's that, that journey of conversion that I want to explore together this week as we deepen our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the fourth step of conversion is that we do indeed change our life. As John the Baptist said, we have to bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. You cannot say, Pharisees, you have Abraham to your father. It does not matter who your father is, except the Lord God. It is not good enough, brothers and sisters, to say, I have the truth. It is a question of what we are doing with that truth in our life that affects our journey of conversion. And I really knew that I had to look into this subject a little bit further when I was reading 2 Peter chapter 1. And he says there, when he talks about our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, he says you need to understand these things so that you are not ineffective, you are not unfruitful, you are not nearsighted, and you are not blind. And this word ineffective basically means lazy. Once you have this knowledge, and he means the experience of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life, it is not good enough to be lazy. It is not good enough to be unfruitful. You cannot sit there and be nearsighted. In other words, just to be focusing on yourself, to be inward looking, to be blind to what is the art of the possible in your life of discipleship. You have to move on from the waters of baptism to live a full life, a rich life of conversion in the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. And so we come to what I call the, the zebra test. You call these zebras or zebras? Zebras. Okay. I'll go with the flow for the time being. I am, in, I am in your country. These are such beautiful animals. Now I don't know whether they're white stripes on black zebras or black stripes on white zebras. But when Kate and I lived in Kenya for a couple of years, it was a Always one of those great pleasures to drive along the road and to see the zebras grazing in herds. And one of my favourite commutes was to, to drive up out of Nairobi, up to 8,000, 9,000 feet to the top of, top of the escarpment, to then drop down into the Rift Valley, this, this same seismic fault which links up with the Mount of Olives as you then drive down three, four thousand feet into the valley floor, passing the, the dormant volcanoes and the, the volcanic lakes, 
and Lake Nakuru with its tinge of pink around it with the flamingo and passing the herds of giraffe and zebra on the sides of the road. And it went through my mind, what is this valley going to look like when the Lord Jesus Christ returns? But maybe this is going to split in two and, and the dormant Mount Longanot is going to explode again. But anyway, back to the zebras. No zebra is the same. They might all look the same to us, but actually all their stripes are different, just as we are all different. And being converted is not a matter of being different from each other. It's a matter of being different from who we are when we were baptised. Has the Lord Jesus Christ made any difference at all to our personality, to our characteristics, to our priorities? Have we turned round for a start with, and have we faced in the other direction? Are we different from when we first came to know the Lord Jesus Christ? And so when you look at repentance, we talk about thinking differently. We talk about changing one's mind. We know that this is the very basis of salvation. And I don't want anything of any of my remarks this week to challenge you, to make you concerned that you will not be in the kingdom. Because if you have come to a faith and repented and been baptised, you have entered in, brothers and sisters, to grace. You have changed from death to life. Conversion is just a matter of how rich your life can be in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to challenge you, but I don't want to worry you. It's something that precedes baptism. It's something necessarily that has to bring forth fruits. But when we come to this idea of conversion, it, it's, it has a different meaning. This word, strepho, this, it means a twisting around. And it's almost as if, before you are baptised, you are facing in this direction your old way of life. When the things of this world mean so much, your career goals, in my case, and you are dead set and maximising the potential of fulfilling your ambition, of, of working on the edge of your competencies, of being challenged each and every day. And as you get to know the Lord Jesus Christ, you begin to know, just like, like, like that zebra, you have to turn around and you have to face the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is He that you confront in all His glory and all His majesty and all His beauty. And you begin to see the person and the character and the love. And you realise that you need to become a dim reflection of Him. And it is once you are facing him that you can begin to follow. And so you get this, this conversion. You might, well, you see, have changed your mind and been repented and say, I now need to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. But unless you get up off your knees and you turn around and you start to follow, then in my words, or the words of Luke 16, we are wasting our possessions. We have not yet twisted around to face the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but I have a problem with oscillation. Because there are times when I am facing this direction, and I very much hope that by the end of this week we shall all be facing this direction. But it's only a matter of time before the pull of my human nature and my life and my dreams pulls me back here. And and I kind of end up in a a resting position in this direction, which is quite handy because I'm facing you. 
And it kind of means I've got a foot in this camp over here and I can follow in this direction if I want to and I'm, I'm ready to go. I'm like I'm on the starting line of the 10,000 metres. And there are times when I can kind of turn around and I can face this direction as well. And maybe that happens when you put on your grey suits, Aaron, and your tie, and you get ready to go to the meeting. And I see if I'm facing this direction, I can look both ways. I can have the best of both worlds. I've got my, my eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ over here, but I can still participate. But the problem is, I'm not moving. I'm rooted to the spot. And it's only when I can turn my conviction, my energy, my heart, my mind, my soul, and my strength, that when I can face the Lord Jesus Christ, I can begin to move. And I can be of use to Him in my discipleship. So there's the difference between repentance and conversion. Changing one's mind and then twisting around. It's a changed attitude in repentance. It's a changed life in conversion. And it's fascinating that if you were to look at all the examples of this word turning, so translated in most of the versions for the word conversion, you are, you are leaving behind things of your old life, the vain things, and you're turning to the living God who made heaven and earth. And who would want to be pursuing vain things when you can follow the Lord God who made heaven and earth? And it's so logical when you think about it. And yet how quickly we get pulled back if you're anything like me. And you're turning around from idols, those self-made gods that fill our life, to serving the true and living God. Matthew 18 is beautiful. You disciples, you want to be the greatest. Can we sit next to you in the kingdom of God? The disciples were arguing about who was the greatest. And they were facing this direction about self-esteem, rubbing shoulders, nothing of humility and service. You need to be facing up to being like children and humility. You should turn your back on darkness and ignorance and be looking at the light in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You leave behind sin and you fall on the power of God so that you can perform deeds in keeping with repentance. No longer are you disobedient. You are turning to the Lord. You are childlike. And throughout Acts, people turn to the Lord, to the Lord, to God. And as Peter says, you are no longer straying like sheep. That's my subject with the teens. But you return to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. And so, when you think of the prodigal son... And you think of the fun that he had. You think of the life that he lived. You think of the friends that he made for a time. And then he came to his senses. And he fell to his knees. He recognised his sin. Humility entered his heart. And he expressed a desire to serve. There was repentance. But he didn't stay where he was. He didn't stay surrounded in that dangerous environment which could so easily keep him facing in that direction. It says, doesn't it, that he arose. He turned. And he went back to his father. And the father ran out to meet him. 
And they made merry with such a joyful feast that it was as if they were spinning around with a strong emotion that the lost sheep had returned. He was dead, but was now alive. He was lost and is found. And we're just left there, aren't we, on tender hooks, wondering what happens next. Does, does the elder brother come to his senses? Does he, is he able to swallow his pride? Does humility finally enter his heart? Is the family reunited or does it live with division? Does the young brother, having got up and gone back to his father and done so well, does he suddenly get the wanderlust again? And turn back to his old ways. Such is the push and pull of human nature on our life. But there is the difference between repentance and conversion. Conversion is all about the life that we live in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a wonderful writer called William Barclay who wrote a whole series of really thought-provoking books. And, and he and one of them, turning to God, set out a series of attitudes which in his experience Christians were demonstrating in their life or people that he came across. The first category is this, the, the, the fools. Those people that say in their heart, there is no God. And we, we know them, don't we? We see them at work. We, we talk to them across our garden fence. Those that are quite happy to accept the idea of evolution. Those that find it very convenient to say, well, there is no higher authority than me. I can choose what I want to do. There is no God. There are those who are quite happy to accept there is a God, but a God who places on me obligation? Ha! I want nothing to do with him. I, I have free will. Well, why should I go and follow the will of somebody else? I'm sure we know people like that as well. There are those, and this, brothers and sisters, really struck home to me, the... He quotes from the French philosopher Voltaire. Now, I don't often quote from philosophers. In fact, this is probably the only quote that I have. We nod, but we do not speak. How many, how many days of your week, brothers and sisters, does that describe you? You are aware of God, of course. But you don't seem to have the time to stop and spend in His presence. I have a neighbour called Cliff. And uh, in UK, it's a very small island, our houses are about 15 feet apart. So when we built an extension on the back of our house, he wasn't too happy about it because it cut out some of his light. And uh, he gave us the cold shoulder. And there were times when we would see him in his front yard and we'd walk down the street and we'd say, Hi Cliff. And he'd just nod. Wouldn't even say anything to us. And it became a little bit of a competition between Kate and myself to see whether we could get him to speak to us, which perhaps isn't a very Christian attitude at all. How many days of the week are you a cliff? Apologies to anybody called cliff. God is there. Always by our side. How many times do we give him the cold shoulder because we are so focused on what we need to do that day? We give him the briefest of nods. Perhaps there are times in our life where 
you know, we have got everything boxed up. It's like, it's like Jim's shop. If anybody gets the chance to go in Jim's shop, he has got everything perfectly set out. If you want an eight-inch screw, he knows exactly which little tray on which part of the yard of the shop to go to. And he'll pull it out and he'll get it out of its box and say, there it is. Where is religion in your life? Do you have it in a nice little compartment that you can then put back in the drawer and close it? And then it was time to get religion again. And you open the drawer and you get it out and put on the suit and the tie. Religion has its compartment that does not exceed its place. It doesn't impinge on the things that I want to do. Is that where you are in your journey? Maybe when difficulty strikes, you, you then turn to God. It's dead easy then, isn't it? Because you realise that there is nothing to offer over here in the vain things of this world, in the idols of life even your colleagues at work. And you suddenly quickly face the Lord Jesus Christ and you fall on your knees again because there is love and salvation and healing and conversion and opening of the eyes in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when things get tough, brothers and sisters, we turn in this direction and it's so easy. And no wonder chastening comes upon us. It's the Lord God's way of just turning us around again. Is that when you face the Lord Jesus Christ? But then when the difficulty passes and the sun comes out, you're back here. This is the steady state. This is conversion. To live is Christ. When your relationship with God, when your appreciation of his love for you is that magnet which keeps you facing in that direction and your life is following him, Not just nodding, but conversing. Not just conversing, but seeking help. Not just seeking help, but asking for guidance. Not just asking for guidance, but recognising that you can do nothing without Him. That when you are weak, then you can rely on His strength. That is conversion. And so here then are these words to Peter. When you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter, you've sprung back here. And and when you've thought it through, when you've been through this experience of your life and you've come to your senses and you're again facing this direction, then strengthen the brethren. Use this experience that you've been through to share with others, to tell them what not to do, to help them through their oscillations of their life. And so conversion then becomes this this continual challenge in our life to turn ourselves round, to be attracted to the magnetism of the character and personality of the Lord Jesus Christ and to go and use that experiences to help others. And so what, God willing, I hope that we will do this week is to look at some of the incidents in the life of Peter as I ask, have I been converted? First of all, tomorrow we'll look at why he stepped out of the boat. Why would you get out of something which is made of solid wood and step into something which is wet and wobbly? 
But that, I think, is what the Lord Jesus is asking us to do in our life of faith. Why did he do it? Well, then look at this idea of freedom. Peter, the sons are free. So how do we understand this idea of freedom? And are we using it? Or are we still held captive or bound up by whatever it might be? Well, look at his reaction to the empty tomb. And I really want to challenge you to say, how well do you know the risen Lord? Well, then look at this incident of, shall I forgive my brother seven times? Do we really understand what true forgiveness is and how we can forgive others? And then at the end of the week, we'll end up in 2 Peter chapter 1, where Peter maps out for us a picture of the converted man and shows for us the perspective that we should have in our life. So I hope, brothers and sisters, you will put up with me as I ask you the rather rude question. Have you been converted? It's something that I am struggling with. I do not want to be lazy or ineffective or unfruitful or blind to the love and power of the Lord in my life. And I hope we can explore that subject together this week.